forward to the class. We're now recording. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to our panelists. Um, we're going to talk about the health and wellness competency in MAC and I'm going to ask Sam to put up the um, SLOs and the rubric. I think this is a really helpful starting place, um, but I would like to have the three panelists from today just kind of introduce yourself, talk about your role um, on campus and kind of how that intersects with health and wellness as a competency as well. So let's start with Jill. And then if you, then we can just pass it off to the next co-host. I mean, well, next panel, sorry. Sorry, Laura. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jill Bevel and I serve as the Director of Recreation and Wellness here at the university. I've been at UNCG since 2011. I'm, I work in the Division of Student Affairs and um, I work out of the Kaplan Center. And so where I align with this conversation today is really the co-curricular student affairs activities and services and events that we have and that we offer across the Division of Student Affairs that align with the health and wellness um, MAC competency. And so um, yeah. spent some time this spring on a committee that was uh, that brought together folks from student affairs as well as academics in looking at the MAC competencies and where the SLOs might align with some of the activities and programs that we have in the hopes that um, faculty and instructors would see the value in sending their students to some of the programs and initiatives that we have coming out of the Division of Student Affairs. Um, recreation and wellness is just one aspect, certainly the health center, the counseling center, campus activities and programs, intercultural engagement. There's lots of areas within the Division of Student Affairs that touch on health and wellness as, as competencies. Um, but I served on a committee that I believe is ongoing that brought together folks from academics and student affairs to look at this and how we can better align and be more intentional with the work that we are doing. And so I spent some meetings over the course of the late spring and summer with Sam and Donna and Jen Whitney from the Counseling Center looking at how these align and what we have in student <clears throat> affairs as far as our co-curricular learning outcomes are not necessarily mirror images of what is in the MAC competencies, but they are certainly aligned. And so we're continuing that work. We're at the very early stages of what that looks like, but I'm here today representing the co-curricular and Laura, I'll pass it back to you. Great, Deanne, if you can introduce yourself. Good morning, everybody. I am Deanne Brooks, um, an associate professor in the Department of Kinesiology. Uh, there I teach across our curriculum. So undergraduate courses, graduate courses. I'm currently the graduate program director in our department. And um, I also chair our EDI, um, our EDI committee within the department. When it comes to health and wellness, our major is designed to help undergraduate students understand um, some of the science and theory around physical activity and its connection to health and wellness. Um, but more broadly, we, we talk about the idea of wellness as a quality of life issue, um, wellness as an equity issue, wellness as um, part of our conversations about community health and, and public health. And so uh, I think about these, this, this rubric, these competencies uh, personally in the courses that I teach, whether or not they are tagged as a health and wellness competency under the MAC curriculum, because these are concepts that students need to know and understand in order to better, um, in my opinion, um, be better prepared to serve the field of kinesiology. And so um, I try to incorporate these competencies into any class that I'm teaching. And I think they are suited to be in incorporated in a variety of courses across campus. Back to you, Donna. <laughs> and then uh, Sam, if you would go ahead and introduce yourself and maybe share a little bit about the information literacy portion in particular. Yeah, so my name is Sam Harlow. Um, one of my roles here at UNCG is I'm the online learning librarian, but I'm also a liaison librarian where I work with kinesiology, community and therapeutic recreation and public health education. Um, so I've worked within um, health 
uh, information literacy and um, health research with a lot of the people here um, for a long time. So I was the MAC and Health and Wellness Fellow um, over the summer. So we developed, um, and even before that, I was on the um, committee that helped develop the student learning objectives that Laura put on the chat. And we have up here on the screen, the rubric that goes into more detail of the of all the different student learning objectives. So as a librarian um, and my role um, as uh, the MAC Health and Wellness Fellow is that I help a lot with the information literacy um, comp part of it, which is new, um, as a lot of you might know. Um, we First off, health and wellness, uh, the whole thing for MAC is new, um, but integrating the um, information literacy components is also new. So those are the two at the end where we're asking uh, to synthesize information from multiple sources to support arguments um, and or inform, and then incorporate and cite sources accurately and correctly. Um, so um, if you have any questions about that, let us know. Um, and again, Laura dropped the, the four SLOs within there, um, within the chat, and then this rubric helps with that. Um, and then I can talk about a little bit, Laura, now, or if you want me to wait, the Canvas course and the uh, website that goes into more detail, but I can also wait. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to go ahead and share that, I was trying to find the self-enrollment link so I could put it in the yeah, chat. Yeah, I have it up because um, there's a Go link, but my brain is um, mushy. But just to show you before I drop the um, enroll link in here, we did develop a Mac Health and Wellness Canvas organization uh, where it's meant as kind of like a community of practice where we can share what we're doing in terms of health and wellness um, and Mac at UNCG. Um, so it, of course, goes over the four SLOs that we've mentioned a couple of times times now, but it does have a couple of um, things set up to help in terms of the content, such as stuff about competency-based education, which MAC is based on, um, and then the information literacy resources, as well as campus resources uh, that Jill was talking about and beyond of, uh, of who uh, has reached out. Um, a lot of what we've done too is kind of show that health and wellness at UNCG can go beyond um, HHS beyond, um, you know, again, these more what we consider health sciences. So again, a lot of humanities, how to, you know, connect in terms of humanities courses as well. Um, so there's discussions in here where people are welcome to share syllabuses, introduce themselves and talk about what they're doing with MAC health and wellness. Um, and we do periodically make announcements um, in there about health and wellness um, stuff going around campus, MAC stuff going around campus. Um, so I'm going to drop the self enroll link in there. Uh, I'll leave student view. Y'all y'all know what Canvas looks like on the back end. Um, and uh, I will drop that now since I yep. forgot the building. Yep, I already put it in there for you. I already took care of it. Um, so the self-enrollment links in there, it's a really a great resource that I think is going to get continually built upon as we grow Mac. So it's always a good place to come back and visit. Um, but just to kind of get us started specifically around the health and wellness um, competency. What we're finding in a lot of these webinars are folks are really interested in how do I operationalize these learning outcomes, right? How do I begin thinking about them? What questions should I be asking as I'm thinking about my own disciplinary work as related to this? And as all three panelists kind of already hinted, you know, health and wellness is not meant to be just the health disciplines. It is meant to look at wellness in a very very kind of holistic global approach. Um, so for our panelists, could you share with us a little bit about how you're conceiving these um, four learning outcomes and really how do you begin to operationalize them in a competency-based approach to general education? I'll go for, Jan, do you want to go first? No, go <laughs> I'll follow you, Sam. Okay, I'll just talk about, again, like as a librarian that integrates with a lot of different departments, as well as has um, worked kind of across, um, again, disciplines in terms of we um, actually have worked this year with a couple of um, English courses, religious courses, um, classics courses that are incorporating the health and wellness competency. Um, these have been put in actions in a lot of different ways, and that's pretty cool. Um, so uh, one example is Heather Adams is doing an English course um, where it is about health and wellness 
wellness and rhetoric. Um, so, um, and it deals with a lot of that. She's also teaching a graduate level course where they're dealing a lot with health and wellness and rhetoric. So um, she's um, incorporated it in a lot of different ways. So she's a great contact to think about in terms of like interdisciplinary approaches, humanities approaches. Um, I know uh, there's a couple, there's a lot of people here on the panel who have already started implementing it in their own cor courses, as well as um, people in the audience. Like uh, I work with Donna, Donna does a great job of integrating a lot of this stuff, even in non-MAC courses, um, as well as Joan Sutton, who's here. Um, we uh, revamped and we're still revamping uh, Community and Therapeutic Rec Recreation 101 that deals with the um, uh, leisure and health and wellness, right? And even though it's a, you know, uh, a 100 level course, we've done a lot with the information literacy component of terms of having them cite where they're getting stuff from, kind of knowing about evaluation when they're Googling health information on the internet. Um, and I know, again, we've worked with a lot of y'all in the library, no matter who your liaison is, and that we can kind of come in and help in those ways. See ya. I'll, I'll follow that. Um, and I'll just, you know, I have to just brag a bit that Sam is our liaison in the library for kinesiology. Um, we have a lot of students who come to our major because they have a background in just, they like to work out, they like to exercise, or they, they, they've had experiences playing sports. And so the information literacy program that Sam, I brought her into my classes to talk about that has been just so valuable because it is, all right, this is your experience versus, or sometimes, you know, and con let's, let's connect your experiences to um, the disciplinary literature. What does it mean to have sources that we can really trust and rely on? And so those conversations are really important. So Sam, I'm so glad that you are our librarian. Um, so I guess to answer this question, I will start with two examples that I implement in, in my courses that seem um, maybe kind of broad, but I think uh, demonstrate bringing the different components of this, this competency together. And so one is um, I feature a couple of programs in my, in my courses. So one of the courses that I'm teaching is uh, physical, uh, instructional methods of physical activity instruction. And so traditionally, that's where we teach students, you know, what are the four steps to teaching a technical skill? You know, how do you um, use music to help uh, in designing a physical activity group exercise program, that kind of stuff. Um, to me, that's basic. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get students excited. And so one of the things that I think is really important is that we help students understand, not understand, share about the communities that they come from and that we all share about and learn about the communities that we're gonna serve with our kinesiology um, knowledge. And so two of the programs that I feature in my courses, one is the Black Feet Nation Boxing Club. And their um, ESPN has a really short documentary about this boxing club. And it was designed out of a real community need to teach women of the Black Feet, women and girls of the Black Feet Nation how to fight for themselves in response to the numbers of missing and murdered indigenous women. And so when we think about physical activity, like the physical activity of boxing, there is a real connection and importance of this that goes beyond you know, looking good, looking a certain way, even some of these medicalized reasons that we, we, we think of physical activity. And so in that, if we start with that documentary, one, if there's an awareness of this um, social need, social um, issue that, you know, more people need to be aware about so that we can um, contribute to hopefully uh, eradicating the, 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 the this, this really um, devastating circumstance. But the other thing is that now we can talk about um, other aspects of, of wellness that surround um, particular populations, indigenous populations, um, minoritized populations in general. We can go to the literature. And so outside of that documentary that we watch, we can now um, you know, go to the literature to look at some um, epidemiological evidence of uh, health 
health, health disparities. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what we can do from a perspective of kinesiology to, to, to tackle some of those public needs. And then we can also think about advocacy and program development. And so another program that I really feature is one um, called Girl Trek, and their slogan is take a walk, join a movement. Um, their tagline, their goal is to get 100, um, a, a million black women walking. And, you know, that's a health uh, goal, but their goal is very much connected to healing community. Um, it's a, a trauma-informed approach. So again, my goal is to take this idea of kinesiology exercise and connect it to something um, that's deep, right? Something that is, uh, that, that, that gets the feels going so that now people are energized to, to make a change. And so um, when it comes to implementing these or uh, meeting these four SLOs, there are creative ways to do it. And that's just two programs that I feature and we can connect to that, the literature, we can connect to that, um, the advocacy piece. We can build skills about citing resources, right? We're not just relying on an ESPN documentary. Let's get to the details behind that documentary. And it's interesting for students. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop with that. And Laura, can I jump in real quick? Just a few things that we're doing out of the Division of Student Affairs. And so we are working from um, a model of the dimensions of wellness that includes the eight dimensions and the ones that we've included are physical, social, emotional, financial, spiritual, environmental, intellectual, and occupational. So you can see where that model really does cross over a lot of the work that we do within the division of student affairs. And so that's the lens from which we're approaching it. We feel as if the work that we're doing through the program services and events that we offer across the departments really hits on the first three learning outcomes. I don't know that I can necessarily say we dabble into the fourth, but certainly um, getting into the first first three. Um, there's a lot of different types of programs and initiatives that we have going on from passive programming, tabling, outside on Cal College Avenue. Typically it was done inside the EUC, but that is outside on College Avenue right now. So some of the larger um, one-off events or series of events. I know Jen Whitney is on the call from the Counseling Center and she has some groups out of the Counseling Center as well where students meet on a more consistent basis to have further conversations and in-depth conversations. And that's just one example. Um, another example I will give is um, the Ask, Listen, Refer training that we do around mental health and the QPR training we do around suicide event, um, awareness and prevention. And both of those are available to students. Ask, Listen, Refer is an online tool, whereas QPR is done both online right now, but also in person. Um, and those trainings are for students as well as for faculty and staff. I know some of the FYE courses have implemented Ask, Listen, Refer and QPR in their courses this fall semester, which has helped expand um, the reach that we have coming out of the Division of Student Affairs, but also given the students in those courses a different look at um, thank you for pulling that up for, for some of the supports that we have and the trainings that we have that are ongoing. Um, and so this initiative for us is really expanding our reach um, and as well as the collaboration and partnership that we're seeing from the Division of Student Affairs um, with the academic unit. So thanks. Yeah, Jill, and I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about specifically how faculty might be able to partner with student affairs um, to really bridge this kind of space of here are these great resources and activities happening around campus. Here's how maybe I can incorporate them in my courses or who maybe I can work with in student affairs to come up with new ways of engaging students beyond just the course and the course content. Yeah, Laura, I'm happy to answer that. And I think that was sort of the question we dabbled with this summer when we were talking about the MAC competencies and the alignment with the division and, and the, challenge, the challenges that it presents, because I think we have some folks who understand the connection and have a sense of what the Division of Student Affairs does from a program service events standpoint. And then we have some folks who maybe don't understand the co-curricular and what's available to them. And so I think it's a challenging place to start, but I think this is a great conversation to be having. I know that there is talk about additional resources coming out, whether it be through the Canvas course that Sam 
mentioned earlier that could be seen as resources and a one-stop shop, if you will, for, for faculty and instructors to be able to find the different programs and events. I think for us in student affairs, we're still trying to identify which of the programs that we have that really align that would work with faculty and instructors on bringing either bringing students, sending students, or coming into the classroom ourselves to have some further conversation. But I think all of those options are available options. And I think there are folks across the Division of Student Affairs who would be willing to um, come and speak or provide additional information. And so um, because health and wellness does cross over so many different disciplines from an academic side, um, I think it's hard to pinpoint just one person as the contact. I think it's really a, a dependent on what the instructor or professor is looking for as to who might, might align best. Um. Yes, so um, certainly thinking through some of those connecting points, you know, Jennifer, I wonder, Jennifer Whitney, if now's a good moment for you just to briefly talk about mental health first aid and maybe some of the things coming out of um, the counseling center that faculty can begin thinking about as they're thinking about health and wellness and expanding it beyond just what we traditionally can term as like physical health to that kind of holistic approach of health and wellness. Yeah, thank you so much. So mental health first aid, um, we are working on our website. So it's just as beautiful as this QPR website. Um, but you can certainly look at, um, it is an, an international training and um, there was a pass through grant and the governor has actually um, given money to all universities in North Carolina um, to train trainers in mental health first aid. And so we currently have four trainers on campus. Um, a police officer, Shazad, uh, Chess Kennedy, who is our um, coordinator for our Spartan Recovery Program, and two students. And we're going to actually be training more folks here in the not too distant future. And so mental, first, mental health first aid builds on QP, QPR um, in a way that QPR, as Jill explained, and as you can see on the website, is very um, suicide prevention specific. Um, whereas mental health first aid is a comprehensive longer training um, that is mental health broadly as well as substance use uh, prevention and intervention. And much like QPR, the tagline is um, about um, responding, identifying, and referring. And so it, it's not training mental health uh, providers per se, but it's building the capacity of our community, so students, faculty, and staff, to really step in and be able to identify what is mental health concerns, what are mental health concerns, and how to connect them with the right resources. And that would be specific to our community, but it would also really um, help anyone and everyone in whatever career they're choosing and whatever communities they belong to outside of um, the university. So much like QPR, it would be pretty amazing to integrate mental health first aid into our classrooms and have it be activities that are aligning with um, what our faculty are doing and, and you know, how we're training our, our students. So is that, is that what you were thinking, Sam? Yeah, and then I dropped in also, you know, Jill um, mentioned, um, you know, some of the offerings out of the Counseling Center. And so I think one of the easiest ways for faculty to plug in, thank you, just brought up that website. Um, you know, oftentimes faculty will want folks to engage in um, the Counseling Center in some way academics. Um, and so, um, while we certainly don't um, want to mandate, and we know it's not a great outcome for students who are mandated to therapy, uh, we do have kind of these lower level, low barrier, easy entry ways to connect with the counseling center that could be for academic credit or could be uh, connected. So for example, in FYE, these are some out of class activities that folks can do um, for their Spartan success programs. All of these right now are via Zoom. So, you know, for our asynchronous students, for our online students, for our distance students, um, and they're really very broad um, in their offerings. Um, and so again, students could drop in once, they could drop in every time. Um, and of course, if you don't make these part of your academic curriculum, certainly just knowing that they're available as resources to students who are, you know, struggling with one uh, thing or another, 
uh, particularly at the end of the semester, distress tolerance and stress management. Those are offered weekly, and we know uh, those are things that our students are struggling with, and this is a way you can just plug your students right into some extra supports. So and we, none of the things I think we noticed in our last webinar, which um, dealt with foundations, was specifically around information literacy and helping faculty think about how do I really begin teaching that and how do I teach that in context of this kind of disciplinary content. And Sam, I don't know if maybe you and maybe Jenny want to share a little bit about some of those strategies of ways of thinking about and operationalize specifically those last two SLOs. Yeah, I can start and Jenny, uh, feel free to uh, jump in. Jenny is our information literacy coordinator and she is here right now as well. And she helped develop a lot of the information literacy components of MAC. Um, and uh, she spoke on the foundations webinar last week. Um, but um, like in my mind too, y'all are the experts in terms of, you know, your own syllabus, student learning objectives, pedagogy, your field, right? Um, in terms of what the library can do to help and with these two is that, you know, teaching our students the importance of information literacy, how we read things, how we find things, and how we cite things, right? Um, research things um, overall. So something that I work with a lot in terms of um, MAC level courses, right, um, is um, the idea of that um, researching your health and wellness is um, a lifelong thing and comes with a lot of complications in today's um, field. So um, like I can see just from who's here, I've worked with a lot of people on, um, you know, again, to me, it's really important to match student learning objectives. So I don't think, you know, something that I think people were kind of afraid of maybe a little bit at the beginning of this was like, we want a research paper for these math level courses, but we definitely don't um, unless it matches your student learning objectives. Uh, what we're really thinking again is what the student learning objective says, right? How do they find stuff about their health and for health, wellness and for you know wellness again holistically um, and are they evaluating it appropriately um, are they um, then on top of that citing where they got it from um, you know and again it could be as uh, much as you know going over details of course of the citation styles um, but a lot of times it's just let you know um, in terms of letting us know where you got it from and how you went through that process so there's a lot of different ways that that can work within you know the student learning objectives y'all already have within your courses um, so you know we've done it within online courses this semester um, you know again humanities courses uh, HHS courses um, nursing courses um, and it just kind of depends so it can work in a lot of different ways in action um, and I'm happy to go over more details of that but Jenny did I miss anything as our you don't have to talk I don't want to put you on the spot either um, but yeah that's it <laughs> Jenny said that was great thanks Jenny <laughs> Well, we have, I think, around 10 more minutes. So if folks have questions, please be putting them in the chat um, so we can kind of share them with everyone that's on the call, not just the panelists, because a number of you are teaching in these courses already. Um, and then we also have a number of great resources from Student Affairs on here as well to think through some of these things. Um, another resource that I think is helpful to point out as we're waiting for any questions to come in um, are some of the specific offices in um, student affairs like o, um, OIE, which does a lot of things around identity and identity development and what that means for health and wellness. So some of those conversations are also helpful. Um, certainly, um, Jill and Jennifer, if you can share with us, maybe is there a contact person that if faculty are like, I have an idea, but I have no idea who to ask, that they could at least reach out and then be directed to the right person in student affairs? I, th I think for me, for right now, probably me as the contact would be a great starting point, and then I can filter. It may not be that I'm the person who would facilitate or, or do it, but certainly to be the connection point, I'm certainly more than happy to, to serve in that role. And I think that's helpful given the committees that I'm serving on as well, just to, to remain that contact so that we know what kinds of requests we're getting and where, where we can better serve. Excellent. Perfect. 
And one thing I did want to um, add quickly because she's not here to add it herself, but I do think, you know, I, there's a lot of work with this is the Weatherspoon Art Museum, um, working with um, Anne um, on that. Um, we do have this in the Canvas course if you are enrolling or already enrolled in the Canvas course, but um, the Weatherspoon and Anne, I guess I like need to fix this error here, but um, doing the program of the art of seeing, right? Um, it's again, a lot of it is to do with again, um, health sciences, people going out into health professions. Uh, she does a lot of work with kinesiology and nursing students on the, again, the art of seeing, how do we see? Um, and again, that can kind of match in with a lot of the um, SLOs and competencies, of course, that we've gone over today. Um, but Anne's great and her contact information is here. Um, if you're interested in that. So um, again, just another, um, again, the importance of the co-curricular, um, you know, of integrating all these great resources we have across campus. Um, and there was a panel um, from HNAC, the Humanities Network and um, Art, I'm sorry, I, I, it's humanities uh, stuff. Um, and we had a panel of people in humanities doing work within the health and science competency. So if you have any questions about that or want to reach out to who we did, um, Francis Bottenberg um, and Elizabeth Perrell helped run that panel. Um, and I can put their contact in the chat as well. Humanities Network Consortium. Thank and you. also, Anne, if you reach out to Anne Grimaldi as well, she'll help you develop a tour of the Witherspoon around whatever research topic. So a number of us in kinesiology have taken our students to the Witherspoon to spend time with Anne to talk about movement, to talk about ways it shows up in art, how to think about these things. You know, um, there was a session I was in about the big basketball exhibit that was just there. So there's lots of really great opportunities to engage with just the plethora of resources the Witherspoon has. And Anne is excellent at kind of curating that in really thoughtful ways um, for all of us. All right, so um, just because we only have about five more minutes, those of you who are currently teaching in health and wellness, so maybe not just the panelists, if you have any great examples of some assignments you're using in class, this would be the group to wanna hear them from. I think that's what we're finding because this competency is brand new. Folks are trying to think through, I'm thinking particularly um, the SLO number two, really easy to do when you work um, in fields like sports sociology, but might be harder in some other disciplines to be able to think through how to do that on such a large scale for a large population. So just want to open it up. Anybody have any examples of assignments that you're willing to share? Well, and you know, I'll give people time to talk. I don't want to like dominate this, but I do want to say um, I work with Joan on a uh, who's on this call. So Joan, you can talk about it too. I don't want to uh, steal your amazingness, but um, a gen, you know, again, a lot of these courses, right, are 100, 200 level courses. Um, and I think Joan does a really good job of incorporating it with it, all of the SLOs within um, an online asynchronous community um, health and uh, leisure course. Um, but also, again, in these kind of gentle ways of doing three and four, um, you know, it, that students have to, when they find information, right, they now have to include a citation, right? Um, they have to uh, go through a module or a just a page within the online course about a evaluating information, right? Like, how do we know if it's trustworthy um, health information? Um, and then they uh, do some activities based on that. Um, so again, I think the nice thing about what y'all being the experts in the field, right, um, in, you know, health and wellness at UNCG is that um, this comp these competencies do give you a lot of gentle ways to do these, to work with the assignments that y'all already have and have already been doing a great job at um, and making these, again, um, kind of interdisciplinary connections um, and competency-based competency education connections as well.
So I can give an example of how I'm considering number two. I'm not teaching in health and wellness this semester, um, but Jennifer Stevens and I have worked on a course for the RCs in years past that look at indigenous physical activity and native health in North America and Canada. Um, and it was always kind of fell in social and behavioral. And so we're now moving to think about this in terms of health and wellness. And one of the final steps in that course, um, originally the plan was to think about kind of this history of native physical activity, kind of pre-contact post-contact kind of moments and what that has meant for how traditional native sport has either been commercialized or erased or eradicated in various ways um, with the final step being a brief look at what that means for health in native communities today, particularly with the disparities in health. Um, so as I begin thinking about retooling that course for the next time it's taught to be taught in health and wellness, that second SLO is really sticking with me of how to really bring through not just the, the kind of impacts of colonization on those health disparities right now, but also how um, Native communities today are starting to reclaim that holistic view of health that's so central to their being um, and its attachment to things like land and place. Did anybody come up? Did I stall long enough for anybody to come up with a good example you want to share in your own courses? <laughs> okay, well, we're right at um, 12.38 and we're supposed to end at 12.40. So um, know that Sam is going to send you an assessment link um, this afternoon. Please do complete it and fill it out. Um, this Recording will be available on the website and you'll get that link as well once it's available. Um, and then Sam, Sam, is there any additional announcements that I'm missing? Nope. All right, well, thank you all. Hope you have a great week and a happy Thanksgiving holiday off that I think we're all really jonesing for. I'm trying to grab this assessment link before y'all leave. Sorry, I was like, doing the panel stuff, but there's the assessment link. I'll also send it in the follow-up email. Um, this is the first time we've done this series. So definitely let us know um, what you think and other ideas that you have if uh, we wanna move forward with this again. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, are there any final questions, concerns before we end? Thanks, Laura, for moderating. Thanks, all of our panelists for being here. I will say that just one thing, I, I, I don't teach until the spring. I teach my first class in the spring. This was very helpful just in terms of thinking about it. One suggestion that I do have is um, it might be kind of cool to like find a place, find a place to have like a repository for like assignments that we can all share with each other. Um, just a thought, um, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, I, I, would think, love to, yeah. I think that's a great idea. And that's, I think, part of the like um, Canvas course um, is that if y'all wanted to email me anything to put in there, um, we have discussions where you can share syllabuses okay. of, you know, people using the health and wellness competency. And like, I think we've all talked about this, but like, you know, I can only speak for myself, I guess, but like, I tired, I am tired, you know? And so like, I think it's like, we haven't had a lot of participation in it, but mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to even email me directly, if you're watching this recording um, or, um, you know, email Laura or anyone else on this that's involved with Mac, we could start putting them within that Canvas organization. Yeah. Well, I, after, I, so I'm teaching for the first time in the spring in one, the residential college, um, the, a course on women's health and wellness. And I've, I've already, my syllabus is done, um, but I've been working out like the calendar and thinking ahead about that. So anyway, um, I'm happy to contribute sort of after the fact for other people who might be thinking about things down the line. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks you all for coming. Have a great Monday. Bye everyone.